So I'm from the University of Copenhagen. I'm going to talk about uh, how to do efficient hierarchical Gaussian process regression. So what is the setting that we're interested in? We have several functions that we observe over time. So this could be, I don't know, blood sugar for different persons. Uh, and we're interested both in these three functions in this example and in the underlying common mean drawn in black here. So we get observations over time. We want to sample from the posterior. So the problem is that we probably don't have three persons. We maybe have hundreds of people. And then it turns out to be very important to think about computational efficiency to actually be able to sample from this model. So here I have a benchmark plot with the time in days on the y-axis. We do a thousand warm-ups and a thousand sampling iterations in SAN and with the number of functions that we observe on the x-axis. And we are interested in around 100 functions, for instance. So just sort of a baseline SAN implementation, what you would do without thinking hard about what to do in this specific example, scales extremely poorly. And I was starting to become unpopular on my section servers. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I started thinking about how fast can we actually go without approximating uh, the Gaussian process. And it turns out fairly fast, at least fast enough to be able to fit it. Okay, so more specifically, what is the model here? So it's already been uh, looked at in a couple of papers by others. Uh, so we have these observations of Gaussian processes F with normal distributed noise. Each function Fi is equal to a common mean process mu, which is the same for all the functions, plus an individual specific process eta i, so each fi has its own eta i. We then place a Gaussian process prior both on this mean process mu and on each of the individual specific deviation processes eta i. Then we have this uh, identifiability uh, criterion that we want the etas to sum to zero. So the Gaussian process priors on the etas are dependent in such a way that they sum to zero with probability one. So essentially we trade one degree of freedom from the etas to instead fit mu. Okay, so how to fit a Gaussian process model in SAN? Many of you already know this, but the nice thing about using a normal distributed noise model is that it is then conditionally conjugate. So this means that in our Hamiltonian Monte Carlo step in the model block, we only need to, uh, to sample theta and sigma. So where theta are the kernel parameters for the covariance structure and sigma is the noise standard deviation. So here it will be important for us in our efficient implementation to look essentially at the log likelihood here in the middle of y given theta and sigma. Then we have the generated quantities block where we, we will have to draw from this the conditional posterior of mu and eta given the just drawn kernel parameter theta and noise parameter sigma. So this is a multivariate normal distribution that we can just find as usual in Gaussian process regression. So this sort of boils down to these two steps. First, we do an efficient implementation of the log likelihood, and then we do an efficient implementation of this conditional posterior draw. So why is it so slow? Let's say that we observe n functions, f1 to fn, at j time points t1 to tj. Then we have this uh, likelihood, this multivariate normal likelihood, with some covariance matrix sigma, which is now very large. So it's an nj cross nj matrix. So let's say we have 100 functions at 100 time points then it's a 10,000 cross 10,000 matrix. So it becomes extremely slow to calculate this log determinant and this quadratic form. It scales essentially as O of nj cubed because we need to calculate this Cholesky factor. So we want to avoid doing the Cholesky factor of the entire matrix sigma. So how do we do that? We impose this design requirement. So we say, okay, all of the functions must be observed at the same j time point. So in general, in the baseline setting, the different functions could be observed at a different number of different time points, but we're gonna impose this uh, design requirement. So let's say you know upfront you're gonna use this method, you give smartwatches to 100 people, you just set them to observe at the same time point. But we're also gonna slacken this in the end. Uh, so the nice thing about this is that you then get this sort of repeating structure in the covariance matrix because all of the functions are observed at the same time point. So we have one matrix G, you don't need to worry about exactly what it is, which is repeated along the diagonal and another matrix H all over the off diagonal. So we want to use this structure to sort of derive nicer expressions for this log likelihood. And for that we use the Kronecker product. So in case you didn't need it, it's uh, the Kronecker product between a matrix A and B is this block matrix. 
where the first block is the first element of A multiplied on the entire matrix B, the second block is the second element of A multiplied on the entire matrix B, and so on. And the nice thing here is that this repeating block structure can be written essentially as a sum of two Kronecker products, so where we have the Kronecker product of the identity matrix and D minus H, plus the Kronecker product of the matrix just filled with ones and H. So we want to use this to simplify the, the multivariate normal log likelihood here. So here I just write vec, which essentially just means in fan language two vector. So we take a matrix, stack the columns to form a vector. Vec inverse corresponds in fan language to two matrix. So it takes a vector and unstacks it back into a matrix. This has some nice properties. For instance, if you take vec of a matrix product of three matrices, it turns out to be be equal to this Kronecker product multiplied by vec of B. So I just give you the result because I don't have so much time. So uh, essentially by applying some different Kronecker product results, we can reach the, these uh, nice expressions. So the log determinant of this large nj cross nj matrix sigma turns out to be equal to the number of functions minus one multiplied by the log determinant of this much smaller matrix sigma zero, which is j cross j, plus the log determinant of this other j cross j matrix sigma one. And similarly, this left division turns out to be equal to this longer expression, where the important point is just that we do left division by sigma zero and we do left division by sigma one, but we no longer do left division by sigma. So this means that if we look purely at sort of the step where we do the Schulewski factorization, we now only need to do Schulewski factorization of two small j cross, smallish j cross j matrices, sigma zero and sigma one, which is O of j cubed, instead of this large matrix sigma, which was O of n cubed j cubed. So this should save us a lot of time in the log likelihood evaluation. Okay, so this takes care of the model block. Now we need to worry about how to draw mu and eta from this conditional posterior. And uh, to not confuse the issue with facts, I just take eta here. So here we can sort of apply similar tricks to get some expressions for the posteri conditional posterior mean and covariance matrix. So we see that again, we have this sigma zero that pops up. So you don't need to worry too much about the specific expressions. The problem here is that, so we now have a nice sort of fast way to calculate the structure of this posterior, but if we actually construct this covariance matrix sigma eta, it's still a huge matrix, of this Kronecker product. And what do we need sigma eta for? Here we actually need it to draw from this multivariate normal distribution. And what happens behind the scene is essentially that we're drawing a standard normal vector and then multiplying that standard normal vector by the Schulewski factor of sigma eta to get the desired covariance structure. So here we're back to this problem of doing the Schulewski factorization of a large matrix. And here, I, I don't really see any way around actually doing the Schulewski factorization. So I started looking around for different ways of doing Schulewski factorization, and I tumbled upon this sort of two times two Schulewski trick, where you can do the Schulewski factorization of a two times two block matrix in this blockwise way. So the upper left corner of the Schulewski factor is just the Schulewski factor of the upper left corner of the matrix. In the lower left corner, you do this matrix division, and in the lower right corner, you take the Schulewski factor of the Schur complement. And then there's this iterative block Schulewski algorithm, uh, which in general is not faster, but we will see how to make it faster in our case. So it's based on this idea. So here I just wrote out sigma eta has this repeating block structure also with some V and some symmetric W. So the idea is we start in the upper left corner, apply this two times two trick once to get the Schulewski factor of the upper left two times two corner. Then we look at one more row and column, apply the trick again. So it's easier with a couple of steps. So we apply the trick in the upper left corner. We look at the upper left three times three corner, but divide it into a two times two block matrix. So now the nice thing is that we already know the upper left corner because we just calculated it in the previous step. So all we have to do is this matrix division in the lower left corner, which also after a matrix multiplication gives us this sure complement, which we then have to take the Schulewski factor of. So an important point here is that the Schur complement actually doesn't grow in size. It's always the same size as V. So this turns out to not matter too much. So what really matters is this matrix division because it grows sort of one block row and block column in each step. So it becomes more and more expensive. 
but this is where we can use this repeating block structure. So if you write down on a piece of paper this matrix division, you realize that actually a lot of the entries will be stuff that we already calculated in earlier steps. So it turns out that when you have this repeating block structure in your matrix, you can actually calculate a lightning fast Cholesky factorization using this uh, iterated block Cholesky algorithm. So combining <laughs> all of these ingredients, and all of them actually turned out to be essential, uh, we get this nice fast performance. So this was all under the assumption that we measured all of the functions at the same grid of time points. So what if you somehow have, maybe you have different data sources, maybe you had some smartwatches that messed up. So let's say you have a group of functions that you measured at the same grid of time points, so they are regularly sampled. And then you have some other group of functions that you just measured at whatever time point. So then essentially if you group the functions that you sampled at the same time points in the beginning, you now have this uh, covariance structure where the upper left corner will have this nice repeating block structure that we used before. And then the rest is sort of C will be partly regular and B will be completely chaotic. So then you can essentially do much longer versions of similar calculations to reach some uh, simplifications and get speed ups. So here, of course, the speed up you get will depend heavily on the proportion of regularly sampled functions. So if almost all your functions are regularly sampled, it will look like the red line before. If almost none of them are regularly sampled, it will look like the yellow line. So that was actually everything. We have a preprint on archive with some a link to a GitHub repository with the same implementation. So thank you. <laughs> questions? Can I choose or is it just? Yeah, yeah, go for it. <coughs> Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. No, no. <laughs> is there any way you can write this as a Kronecker product instead of a Kronecker sum? I don't think so. No, yeah, because then you would get the Koleski so quickly. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think so, but, no, but I'm not sure. One of the, I'm not sure who was first. Aki, maybe. I assume so this was only for normal data, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was only for normal. And you can't use it uh, for like, other data models, non normal data models? No, not immediately, because we use the conditionally conjugate part. Yeah. And it's also like, I've been there. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> so that, that could be another issue. Yes, so it depends heavily on using the normal. Brian? So there's a caveat that I don't really do best in processes, so this may be a non-fair question, but I, I believe that this regular sampling grid also introduces you like a Freudian ethnicity value of selection rate. Do you, first of all, am I remembering correctly, and two, do you have any sense of where that line would fall between? I actually don't know, okay. I have to say. Yeah. You can also use those Hilbert basis approximation methods by essentially sort of, if you have these C tests in the sums, if you make them correlated in the correct way, you also get this sum to zero restriction. So that's another option. Yeah, I think the FFT option is still in GAT. Right? Yeah, ah, okay, yeah. That I haven't thought about. <laughs> maybe one more. If, if you have these data like irregularly, you could also maybe try to uh, split this, you know, the timeline into chunks when you have missing data. I mean, you can maybe integrate over that. Yes. So you can maybe. use your method for the whole matrix, sort of, and then you just similar to you know what they do in the inlet test from the 2011. Very vaguely. <laughs> yeah. So you do some sort of finite element method 
and then stuff like that. So maybe you could skip all of the irregular stuff by make your your own regular grid. Oh yes, maybe. That would also be an option. <laughs> Thank you.